All right, well, we come back to the 10th chapter of the book of Daniel, just uh, an outstanding study, and so far, we've covered two points of our message. You see the outline there in the bulletin in front of you, and uh, the first uh, nine verses so far in Daniel 10, which pretty much has been breakneck speed for me. And uh, glad to uh, state that because who knows, we may slow down at any particular point, but hoping to continue pressing ahead through this great book. Our first point of verses 1 to 4, which I titled Fast Time, and in them we saw Daniel's time of fasting, and this was the idea behind a fast time. And we also received the information that there was a great conflict behind that prophecy. And we continue to see that conflict developing as we looked and continue to look even tonight into our verses. And these all important details uh, of which I've encouraged you re- to review in our message from two times ago. And then last time, the week before Thanksgiving, we looked at our second point, which was a fascinating time. And in that second point, we examined the fascinating question of who is being revealed to us in verses 5 to 6. And in doing so, we understood that that reference is indeed a picture of the pre-incarnate Christ. As evidenced by all of the parallel texts, both broadly to these verses and specifically to the individual elements of each of those two verses, five and six. Texts that we went over like Exodus 28, 1 Samuel chapter 2, Matthew 17, and Revelation chapter 2, John 1, and Colossians 1, and Hebrews 1, all of which are supporting from the New Testament this perspective of the pre-incarnate Christ. Also in Daniel itself, Daniel's chapter 8 and 9, Also, especially Ezekiel chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 1. Uh, Revelation 13 to 19 and Acts 9. So just a gamut of verses throughout the scripture that are affirming for us that what we have in this presentation in Daniel chapter 10 and verses 5 and 6 is the picture of the pre-incarnate Christ. And there are many such pictures throughout the Old Testament. The understanding that this speaking of the pre-incarnate Christ is perfect, is in a perfect accord with what we've seen in this portion of Daniel. Each chapter of Daniel up to this point has had a specific and direct reference to the pre-incarnate Christ. Think about those for just a moment because this is such an important aspect. In fact, if we bounce back a few verses to Daniel chapter 7 we see just such a thing occurring. And that first, remember, Daniel chapter 7 to 12 is the second half of the book. And in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13, we see this first picture in the second half of the book of the pre-incarnate Christ. And in Daniel 7 and 13, it says, I kept looking in the night vision and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him. Just back in verses 9 and 10, we saw the picture of God the Father, the Ancient of Days, on his throne. And now we see the Son of Man, the pre-incarnate Christ, being brought up to him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now this in Daniel is a picture of Christ, but the timing of the picture is that which is after the first advent of Christ, and is therein focusing at his second advent and second coming. And so we have a connectivity here, a direct connectivity from Scripture, from the Old Testament pointing forward, visioning at that point a pre-incarnate picture of Christ, but the vision which is coming to fruition is at his second coming, and a, a beautiful example of that. 
we see another example. And by the way, uh, verse 14, just to continue. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 are super important in the New Testament. And the reason that they are, not only because they are a picture of Christ, the one who will reign, Jesus of Nazareth, but also that these are the very words in verse 13 that Jesus spoke before the high priest at his second trial on the night before his crucifixion. You remember that Caiaphas said, as they're trying to come up with different witnesses against him, and people are saying all these things, and they can't even get two people to accord on the lies that they've tried to feed them. And then Caiaphas says, tell me, are you the son of the blessed one? And Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. It is an exact quote of what he is doing and will do as brought forward in Daniel 7.13. So this is a massive scripture. When we think about uh, redemptive history and about the proclamations of Christ, of Jesus of Nazareth as the Christ, as God's Son, this is a massive one. We also see another picture of the pre-incarnate Christ in chapter 8 of Daniel. If you turn ahead to Daniel chapter 8 and verse 15. Daniel 8 and 15. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, standing before me was one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of a man between the banks of the Ulai, and he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. That man who is standing between the banks of the Ulai is the pre-incarnate Christ. And a beautiful picture and understanding of now twice in two chapters, this representation. Also in Daniel chapter 9, in verses 25 and 26. Daniel 9, verses 25 and 26, uh, Daniel 9, 25 says, So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end there will be war and desolations are determined. And you can go back and listen to all of the massive details in that 70 week prophecy. But all that to say, here another illustration of the Lord Jesus Christ. So chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10 all have direct references to Christ. And not only is that incredible, but it reminds me, and as I was studying, I thought, you know, I think that happens somewhere else. Oh, well, it does. And it's in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 7 through 11, there is a reference to Christ in every chapter. It is a beautiful study right now at Christmas, of course, because as we come upon Christ's first advent, many of those texts are prophetic about Jesus' first coming. And so those chapters, Isaiah 7 to 11, are a section in the book of Isaiah. And when we go through our Old Testament survey class, I take you through each of those sections, or Bob does, or whoever's teaching through that time. And Isaiah 7 through 11 is called the scroll of Emmanuel. The scroll of Emmanuel. And of course, we're, we recognize that uh, Emmanuel is God with us and that therein is Jesus referenced in those five books of the book of, I or those five chapters of the book of Isaiah, making them somewhat parallel to Daniel. And so we see all of these pictures. And then it, to conclude our last point, the, uh, the fascinating time in verses seven to nine, Daniel is overcome by the visions 
his friends run and hide, and he turns ashen gray and falls into a deep trance. Exactly as we saw with Adam in Genesis 2 using the same Hebrew phrase, and also with Abraham in Genesis 15, again using the same Hebrew phrase. So this repetition, and we get to grasp it. Okay, he didn't just get a little gray, like maybe you're a little sick in the tummy when you ride with me up Bogus Basin Road. Um, but he is sick to the point of being overcome and going into a coma-like state, exactly as Adam and exactly as Abraham. So we get the gravity of Daniel's stress and strain that's going on in this fascinating time. And again, you can go back and listen to these details in our last message. So after our first two points, a fast time and a fascinating time, we come back to our title, Confounding Considerations, and our theme, which is three astounding times that correlate to your life. And we will see that correlation again tonight as we have each night in the application of our verses. And we come to our third point, which I have titled, A Frenzied Time. A Frenzied Time. And as we consider this third point, let's look at our text again. Daniel chapter 10. I'm going to begin at verse 10 and read through this section. Follow along if you would. Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem. Understand the words that I am about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to your words." But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to days yet future." When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and became speechless. And behold, one who resembled a human being was touching my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke and said to him who was standing before me, O oh my Lord, as a result of the vision, anguish has come upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can such a servant of my Lord talk with such as my Lord? As for me, there remains just now no strength in me, nor has any breath been left in me. Then this one with human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. He said, O man of high esteem, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Take courage and be courageous. Now as soon as he spoke to me, I received strength and said, May my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. And then he said, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I am going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince." A frenzied time. This indeed is just that, a frenzied time. Because as we left Daniel, he slept or was in a more comatose state without strength in tremendous fear from the vision. And this condition continues in verse 10 as Daniel is unable to get off the ground. So Daniel receives a touch now, the question that we want to answer is, who is the one who is giving him this touch? Is this the pre-incarnate Christ from the previous section, or is this someone else? And we'll see that it is not the pre-incarnate Christ because of the context of the verses. And as we work through these first verses, it becomes abundantly clear. Now, the touch of this one on Daniel allows him to get to his hands and knees. This is how staggered Daniel is. He is completely out and unconscious. 
This touch awakens him and gives him the strength through this word to get to his hands and knees, but he's still as yet unable to get up. And in verse 11, the one touches him further, encouraging him by speaking to him. And he first is, encourages him by addressing him, man of high esteem. This is similar to Gabriel's address of Daniel in Daniel 9, 23. And very important for us to recognize that parallel as we're trying to discern who this one is that's touching him. It's quite likely that this is the one Daniel is speaking with. That is Gabriel. And it's even more abundant as we continue to look through these details. And it's quite likely that as we see shortly that all of this will start to reveal one individual. And it's important to note that the touching in verse 10 is the same one speaking in verse 11. That, that may seem like an obvious point, but it's important for us to keep track of. That as we move from verses 10 to 11, it is the same individual who is first touching and then who is speaking to him. And that is, uh, it, it helps us decide what's going on. And he next encourages him by telling him that he has been specifically sent to Daniel. And that because, and because that he has been sent, that Daniel should then stand up. And as a result, Daniel does so, but he is still trembling. So he's now able to stand from passed out to hands and knees to standing, but still visibly shaken. And so much so that he is described as one who is trembling. One aspect to note, although not conclusive, is the comment in verse 11 that the one speaking has been sent. The phrase uh, alludes to a higher one as doing the sending. And this would not be the phrase if this were the pre-incarnate Christ. Although not definitive, it, it does add to our understanding and we'll see yet more. So being encouraged by the angel's touch and that he's been specifically sent, we see the, the purpose of the sending is to convey this message. And this is exactly parallel to Daniel 8, 16, and 7 with the pre-incarnate Christ telling Gabriel to go and explain to Daniel the message. To explain exactly as we just read earlier. And the message conveyed in verse 11 is the word. Remember the importance of that Hebrew word? It can be translated as matter or word. And when we see it, it's that key emphatic phrase that tells us that it's again talking about the vision. It's talking about the crux of the vision that Daniel is dealing with. So literally the words plural at the beginning of verse 11 and then this word at the end of verse 11. And then in verse 12, the angel begins to explain the word or the matter. And the first part of the explanation is an encouragement. Do not be afraid. This is one of the most common messages in scripture, beloved. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Those two phrases occur over a hundred times in our Bible. Why is that? Why does God keep telling us not to be afraid, not to fear? Do you suppose that perhaps it's because we have a tendency to be fearful? We have a tendency to be afraid? We can worry? Anybody ever struggle with a little worry? Don't put your hands up because I know you all will. Or at least I certainly will. And when such things happen, beloved, I want to encourage you, one of the most powerful places to go is into Matthew chapter 6 and verses 25 to 34. This is such an excellent place for us to understand the control that God has and His sovereignty and the uselessness of worrying. So I want to encourage you to consider those verses as you may have opportunity to be fearful or to worry. The next explanation is why he's not to fear. And the answer is because God has heard him. And notice also 
that the recognition began as soon as Daniel began to pursue understanding. This is exactly the same as Gabriel's answer to Daniel back in Daniel 9.22. Another parallel for us regarding Gabriel, the speaker, and in contrast to any who might think that this is the pre-incarnate Christ. You remember in Daniel's prayer, Gabriel later tells him, as soon as you set your heart to pray, I was dispatched to you. Not afterwards, not when God kind of listened to his prayer and said, all right, I guess that's good enough, we'll send Gabriel. God, knowing his heart, immediately as he began praying, dispatched help for him. What an encouragement for us, beloved. God wants to see our hearts. And as soon as we come before him and begin to lay ourselves out, at that second, God, understanding our hearts and our desires, is also in like fashion ready to help us. What a beautiful perspective. And notice also Daniel's approach as he was understood by God. His wonderful two-part approach, that is that he set his heart and that he humbled himself. You know, we have to recognize that when there are things in our heart, there are matters in our life that we are desperate to find answers from God about, we too must be all in in this aspect. We have to be those who come and set our hearts. It's not like, okay, I wonder, you know, what's going on here. Oh, well, God will take care of it. When it's burdening us, when it's something we really have on our hearts and minds, we have to set ourselves to pursue God. And we have to come in humility, recognizing that it's God and God alone that has the strength to bring the answers to us about these details. And because of these elements, the angel came. Notice one other small detail that also contributes to our understanding, that This is an angel and not a pre-incarnate Christ. He addresses God in verse 12 in the third person. That is when you use a proper name or when you call someone by a title. That's a third person reference. And here in verse 12, he references him as God, which is a third person reference. And then he he references himself in the first person with the word I. But the prince of Persia, excuse me, uh, then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before God, your words were heard and I have come in response. Now that, that, that again is not absolutely definitive proof, but that would be very bad grammar to if this was the pre-incarnate Christ who is God to refer to God in the third person and then to turn and to refer to yourself in the first person. So we're getting further corroborating evidence that is showing us that this is not a picture of the pre-incarnate Christ, but rather is an angelic being. So those are important aspects for us to, to recognize. And of course, As we understand this, he certainly, if this was the pre-incarnate Christ, he always has been God. He is currently God and he always will be God. And thus, if he were to reference himself in that way, would have made some parallel type of connectivity between those two references. And he does not. The explanation continues in verse 13 which says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. And this is one of the most exciting verses, and there's so much going on here. And now the explanation changes from Daniel to the angelic messenger. And we're told that for 21 days, he was opposed by the prince of Persia. Several details come forward from this statement. First is the period of time, 21 days. For three weeks, this individual, this angel, has been engaged in a protracted battle. The fact that he was opposed shows us that this could not be the pre-incarnate Christ, for none has ever been able to withstand God. Not even Satan himself 
could stand against God. And especially for three weeks. We look at Revelation 20 to see more on this. To see how God absolutely confines, destroys all of those that are associated with Satan. All of the wicked of the earth. The false prophet, the antichrist. And then constrains and chains Satan. So there is no battle that goes on between God and Satan. Both Daniel 4.35 and Romans 9.19 confirm for us that none can stand against God. And the designation here is another thing that's of interest to us. That first one of Prince of Persia. That word prince can mean either ruler or leader. And the fact that he is battling God's angel shows that, that this is a reference to a demonic angel. As no man could resist an angel. So the prince of Persia is not to be understood in this context as a man. But rather as an angelic being who is, who is engaged in this battle. And notice he is the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Another thing that some people wrongly conclude about this demonic angel is that somehow demons are uh, regionally bound. Because he's called the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Don't make that mistake. We'll see what that phrase prince of the kingdom of Persia means as we move through this. But do not ever think that somehow the demonic realm is bound to a geographic region. Some have misinterpreted that because of the, um, uh, the demoniac and the, the legion who had possessed the man with thousands of demons and that when they went into the pigs and then they were drowned into the sea which I learned a wonderful new pun that Jim came up with but I can't steal his line so we'll leave that um, that um, <laughs> and Bob shared it in men's study but that, that, that some have said that that means that they were regionally bound that then because they died somehow in the sea that they were bound to that region of Galilee that's completely errant and uh, so also would it be to consider that this is a regional designation it is not in any way. So what we recognize here is that this ruler, this demonic angel, is one who has also told us in verse 13 that Michael, one of the, pre, the chief princes, helped this angel in the battle. We're now, if we weren't already, fully confirmed that this is not the pre-incarnate Christ. He would not need any help in any battle, with any individual, certainly not a man, and even more so a demonic entity. And go through the New Testament and look at how they immediately, the demons immediately were cowering in front of Christ. Attempting not to be cast into the abyss before their time. Because there was no contest. So we're absolutely confirmed here that this is an angelic being. So... As we understand that angelic being, we see more detail and it helps us bring a picture together. So like uh, the demonic angel, Michael is called a prince. Further confirming for us that the prince of the kingdom of Persia is not a man, but is also an angelic being. So our subject of an angelic being is now fully developed. It's interesting that in Daniel 12 and 1, Michael is called the great prince who has charge over your people. That is, who has charge over Israel. That helps us understand what's going on in this whole vision. So keep that in mind. Jude 9 calls Michael the archangel, as we have recently been going through in our Sunday morning message. One commentator notes that in Jude 9, Michael and the devil are placed side by side. The archangel and the arch enemy of God. This commentator notes that as the archangel Michael is the indeed arch friend in opposition to God's arch enemy, Satan. It seems likely that Michael is the greatest of the holy angels. But we also have to acknowledge for the grammar because this is how we interpret scripture. We don't just say, oh, well, clearly Michael's the greatest of the angels because he's called the archangel. 
in Jude 9. That is perhaps the case, and I think there's good support for that likelihood, but we also have to acknowledge that in verse 13, Michael is one of the chief princes. Now, that doesn't mean that he could not be the highest of the angels, but there is a designation there that gives us more detail, that there are also uh, a group of angels with a higher status than others, those of the holy angels. So we want to acknowledge what the Scripture is telling us in all these details. So Michael is likely the greatest, but could well be that there are others as well. And Michael is also, as I mentioned, specifically the angel over Israel in chapter 12 and verse 1. Now, we're also told that this angelic messenger has been left there with the kings of Persia at the end of the verse. So it's almost that this piece of information at the end of the verse is the beginning of the whole scenario. That this angelic messenger, who I'm going to call Gabriel from here forward because I believe that's exactly who we're speaking about, that Gabriel was left with the kings of Persia. Recognize now that there's a distinction. The kings of Persia are different than the previously identified prince of the kingdom of Persia. The kings are now relating to human kings. And there are two options for who those could be. Uh, one commentator believes that these kings are King Cyrus and his son Cambasis, or perhaps they are Cyrus and Darius. And that's where I believe that we're better to understand who these kings are, that it is Cyrus and Darius, both mentioned in Daniel 6.28 and in Ezra chapter 4 and verse 5. So I believe it's likely that Cyrus and Darius are those that were involved in this vision and they are the kings of Persia that were concerned. Why? What's unique about Cyrus and Darius? They both had critical roles in issuing decrees for Israel to return, for the Jews to return to Israel. Cyrus issued the first decree, we went over this in our timeline, for the Jews to return in order to begin building the temple, that in 538 B.C., as we had on our timeline again. And then, remember, the work was stopped. The Jews were confronted. All of this is in Ezra 4 to 6. Then the Jews are confronted, and in Ezra chapter 6, Darius is the one that issues a decree for the rebuilding to again continue. So that's why I believe that it is Ezra, or excuse me, that it is Cyrus and Darius that are the two kings of Persia being mentioned in this text. We get, we get great insight regarding the angelic world from these verses. This angel, again, who is, I believe, Gabriel, is from Daniel 8 and 9, is the one whose role is bringing forward this revelation to Daniel. That's exactly what Gabriel's role is in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 13, it's an angel who I believe was also Gabriel who went and spoke to Zacharias. In Luke 1 and 30, Gabriel is specifically mentioned as the one who goes and speaks with Mary. So Gabriel is left with the kings of Persia, Cyrus and Darius. And I believe he is so left, protect them to protect them, which is the role of an angelic watcher. Their role is to protect people. Look at Matthew 18.10, where the Lord tells us this with regards to children. And then we see that while Gabriel is with these kings, that he is engaged in spiritual warfare by a demonic angel called the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Next, Michael the archangel joins Gabriel in this battle and allows Gabriel to come to Daniel's aid. Since Michael is the guardian of Israel, 
And Daniel's focus and visions are specifically about Israel. The issue which Michael and Gabriel were contending was most likely one that would create a tremendous threat to Israel. This is what they are doing. They are protecting these kings from this threat of this demonic entity, this prince of the kingdom of Persia, and think about what could have happened in that situation as they are protecting him. The demonic angel, again, as the one who is the prince of kingdom of Persia, which is not describing his region, it is describing his role as one who is coming to, through these kings, destroy the nation of Israel. That he could, they, that the demon could have had a role in the kings no longer supporting Israel. Namely, not supporting the exile's return and the temple rebuilding. And this, again, the reason that Cyrus and Darius are these kings. The importance of this task and the severity of the battle requires Michael's intervention, and it shows that this is a battle of massive proportion. This is not some minor scuffle. In order to, to require two, angel, two angelic beings to come together is vital for us to recognize what's happening. Tanner notes that if this demon could turn the kings of Persia against Israel, he could perhaps create a situation in which the Jewish nation could be exterminated. Well, we've seen some of that in our modern day. This, of course, was Hitler's desire to exterminate the Jewish nation. But he's not the first. Remember our study from the book of Esther? How near did, did Haman get to destroying all Israel were it not for Mordecai and Esther? By the way, beloved, the timing of Esther is directly parallel with the kings and the period that we're speaking of now in the Persian dynasty. All of this is blending together. And it is incredible to recognize the parallels between these studies. You can go back again and look at Ezra 4 to 6 and see the connectivity to our text. Tremendous overlap of these books. Now that time in Ezra is a bit future, but of course we look at verse 15, 14. Now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days pertains to days yet future. So this is exactly what's being described. Just a couple more details on this unseen angelic world and the doctrine of angelology that we're diving into that all of this encompasses. As we recognize what's happening here, we have these angelic beings that have come together, Gabriel and Michael, to fight against this prince of the kingdom of Persia to keep him from turning the hearts of the human kings against Israel. And all of that beautifully comports with what we see in Scripture. And I want to ask you to turn to one of those places with me right now. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. As we again dive into more detail from the book of Revelation to help us understand Daniel. Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. And it's in that text in Revelation 12, 7, that we see the angelic battle so clearly defined and gives us more insight into what we're looking at in Daniel. Revelation 12 and 7. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and the angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. The, the dragon here is Satan himself. Verse 8. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. 
And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he is only a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place, where she was nourished for a time and time and half a time, from the presence of the serpent. <clears throat> and the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the women, woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river, which the dragon poured out of his mouth. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who kept the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. This picture that we have of Revelation chapter 12 is showing us the identical parallel that Daniel is speaking about. He's showing here Satan himself waging war with the holy angelic host. And why is that? So that he can destroy the nation of Israel because who comes from the nation of Israel? Amen. Our Messiah, Christ. And if, they are, if he can be successful in destroying the nation of Israel, then he can destroy the one who has been proclaimed to crush his head all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. So we have a, a cosmic battle that has been going on since the beginning of time that we're seeing a piece of here in Daniel chapter 10 and we're seeing more of in Revelation chapter 12. And that we see there that at that time, then Satan and his angels will be cast out of heaven into the earth, which has not yet occurred. Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2. God is there in the presence of his holy angels, and Satan is amongst them. And, he, and God mentions to him about Job, have you considered my servant Job who is righteous and upright? And in such a case, we recognize that Satan's access will eventually be removed from him to come into God's very throne. But as yet, it has not. And then at that time when he is cast down, then the earth will be that which receives his foul wrath. And it is that time that we see the parallel coming forth of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where the restraining force of the Holy Spirit is removed. And of course, we recognize the time frame that is referenced here, time, time, and half a time as the great tribulation. All parallel to what we looked at back in the 70 weeks of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. And so what of this angelology? Is this simply examination for the purpose of knowledge? Is this just so that we can understand more uh, about uh, about unrelated facts or things that are, are nothing of Important to us because it is an unseen world which has no direct account? No. Obviously, we must understand what's in the Bible. We need to know it because it's here. But this has a critical application for us today. Why is that? Well, because we too, like Daniel, can become afraid when we see the wickedness of society, when we see everything around us clamoring against what we believe and the church, society destroying itself 
and all the beliefs that we hold true as those which are under attack, those things can cause us to become fearful and to be concerned about the world in which we live. And the same message Gabriel gave Daniel applies to you. Do not be afraid. First off, the battle around us is just like that that Daniel faced. Do you recognize that? The New Testament repeatedly detailing that for us. Ephesians 6.12 For your battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers and the dark forces of the world. It is against Satan. He is the one that is empowering the world around us. Do you remember the text from 1 Peter 5.8? That your adversary, the devil, roars around like a roaring, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's out to devour all of us. He's devout, out to devour any that are contrary to Christ. Because now there has been a change. He's had this perfect plan. I'm going to destroy Israel. Well, now the church has come forward as God's chosen entity for this time. How does he attack that? To attack the church, to attack marriage, to attack the traditional union of husband and wife and homosexuality, to attack the God-given gender of every, cre every created being on this earth. This is the enemy's continued attack against us. So also in 1 John 3.10, which we talked about in our message this past Sunday, that we are either children of our Father God or we are children of the devil and that there's no, there's no fence sitting. So the world around us that seems so contrary to us, it's not the individuals of that world, it's the enemy that is empowering their philosophy and their thoughts. And as we're going to see shortly in Jude, we have a, a role to take with regards to that world. And it isn't to run from them, and it isn't to fight them, and it isn't to accuse them. But it's to seek to save them. But this too can be a fearful thing. And all of this is written for our instruction. When we consider what we went through in Jude, Israel's failure, the angels that are doomed to uh, an internal damnation in the abyss, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, all of this wickedness that around us is a picture in these demonic battles of the wicked world system. And, beloved, they are written, as we're told in 1 Corinthians 10 and 3, for our instruction. We need not be fearful of this. We need to recognize things have never been different. God has always been the one who is being constantly attacked. And His holy people are the ones who have always been under assault. So we need to recognize in light of this that we too need to be like Daniel. And we must not be afraid. Because again, this is written for us. And in all of it, God wins. Yes, there are horrific demonic battles and a wicked world, but all of it, only so far as God allows. None of these are out of God's sovereign control. And He is allowing all of these things for His glory and for our good. So God allows this and He wins the victory and we win with Him. And Jesus has already begun that victory by beginning to conquer death and sin as he died on the cross. And Satan himself already recognizing his certain doom as scripture continues to be fulfilled. So as the pre-incarnate Christ told Joshua, be strong and courageous. And as we see Gabriel telling Daniel, do not be afraid. Beloved, may God grant us to recognize in the world around us that we need, fe we need fear nothing. The Lord Himself tells us, do not fear those who kill the body. Fear the one who can cast body and soul into hell. We need to be those who are warriors for Christ. 
We need to be those who go out fearlessly recognizing the victory that Christ is winning, that Jesus has already begun to accomplish through his finished work on the cross that is told for us all the way back in Daniel with specific words that Jesus himself repeated as he stood before his accusers preparing to be crucified for our sins. And we need to go forth in that power and we need to be those who boldly and joyfully proclaim the glories and the excellencies and the grace of Christ, particularly at this time of year. You know, there are so many opportunities that the Lord opens for us in our lives. He opened many doors for us as we went through COVID. Chances for us to acknowledge that if with a microorganism, God can bring this world to its knees, just imagine what he's going to do when he brings his whole arm or his whole army and so now, too, we have those opportunities to recognize this and to go forth in courage. So as we understand this battle, help it to be that which empowers us for our battle. Because we all have one to fight. And it is that fight which is the Lord's to win, and it is ours to, in love and grace and mercy, proclaim that victory through Jesus. So I pray that you will be encouraged in that and that you will not shirk back but that in His strength, you'll move forward. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this reminder. Thank You for this picture into the unseen world, into the ongoing angelic battle. Father, thank You that You are yet still moving Your holy angels so that the enemy is not able to move forward as he would like, to frustrate his efforts. And yet You allow him just enough rope so as you will one day chain and hang him with that rope. And Father, until that time, we pray that you would strengthen us for the work that you've called us to do, that we would continue to proclaim the excellencies of Christ, and Lord, that you would be pleased to use us for your honor and glory. And we give you thanks for this work, praying it in Christ's name, amen. Well, we meet next time for our final meeting this year, next Wednesday. And uh, Lord willing, we will conclude chapter 10 at that time. Have a blessed evening. God bless you. Drive carefully out there.